There we go, excellent. Hello, everybody. So, um, <clears throat> my name is Simon Whiteley. Um, I'm a system safety engineering consultant. Um, I work as a system safety engineer across all parts of the engineering product project lifecycle across a variety of industries, primarily civil and defence aerospace, so large multi engine aircraft, fast jets, and helicopters, uh, some air traffic control, uh, weapon systems. Defence Maritime, Defence Nuclear, Armoured Automotive, Healthcare and Government IT, Rail and Pharmaceuticals and then developing into unmanned air systems, autonomous vehicles and cyber security. So there's a lot there, <laughs> but mainly aerospace and defence. But um, being a contractor for so long gave me the opportunity to basically pick and choose the type of projects that I was interested in and that I wanted to work on. And that's given me quite a unique view across the design and engineering life cycle across a different of industries. So there are a lot of common issues with healthcare and engineering, and it's just good to be able to get that perspective. Um, now I offer consulting training and coaching primarily at the moment in the use of the stamp based safety assessment methods across the whole life cycle, but predominantly accident and incident investigation, which is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm also a keen volunteer and I've recently celebrated 10 years volunteering at the Royal International Air Tattoo. So what Andy was saying earlier on, you know, put a bit of a shiver down my spine. Um, but today you've got some basic objectives of this presentation. Number one is to exercise your mind. As the saying goes, minds are like parachutes. They only work if they're open. Um, I'd like to spawn some new ideas in your minds. Um, I'd like to provide an overview of this topic. And I'd also you know, need to highlight that we haven't got that much time. There's a lot to get through. So we're not going to be solving the case study today. So I'd like to, after this presentation, I'd like you to be able to recognise what is meant by stamp um, and what is meant by a cast analysis. Um, I'd also like you to appreciate the core process of a cast accident analysis um, and also appreciate how to apply the cast accident analysis approach as part of an accident analysis that you do yourself. So there's some quite lofty goals and as I said, there is a lot to get through. So we're going to be going through this at quite a rate. So to give you a bit of context then, so hands up who's familiar with the diffusion of innovation curve? Does that mean any says a few people there? Not so many. Okay, I'll go through that. So essentially the diffusion of innovation is a theory of how, why, and how fast new ideas and technology spread. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I'm highlighting this is because I need to put stamp and the cast accident analysis into context. So we are at the very early days of this approach being developed in academia, starting to be used in industry, you know, it's early days. Um, and <clears throat> the usage of these approaches is predominantly in, pri in private behind closed doors. And that's for two main reasons. The first is when you're talking matters of safety, if you start to, if you start to use a new approach and find issues you don't really want to air your dirty washing so you're not going to publish papers and talk about it in public but also the use of this approach provides a significant competitive advantage and so those organizations particularly in automotive and defense that are using this they're sort of keeping stum about it um, and also the adoption maturity varies across different industries and different countries now stamp originates from the united states so naturally u.s companies u.s academics u.s industry are really leading with this um, and essentially what i'm trying to do is get stamp from academia put it into the mainstream and help people to start to take advantage of it because the longer it spends in this early innovators stage you know the, the more accidents that are going to be more expense you know, I want to give people an advantage there. Now, over the last few years, I've uh, been doing various webinars, various training presentations, and I've had interest and usage from people across the globe, from over 22 different countries, 17 different industries or domains. And the domains that I've highlighted in green, they're just a highlight. They're the industries that are really embracing this and really pushing forward, experimenting with it and learning with it, um, and particularly accident and incident investigation, which we're going to focus on today. So why do we need stamp and what is meant by stamp? I've not actually said what that is yet. Is it, can I have a show of hands for anybody who knows what stamp is? Not many, okay, you do. Come on, get your hand up. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> why do we need stamp? Well, this is just uh, a news clipping from uh, the Guardian newspaper with regards to a 737 aircraft that was taken off from Belfast. And the aircraft essentially struggled to climb and if the terrain around the airfield had been more severe, this would have resulted in a catastrophic outcome. Now, you'll notice that the sort of tagline is 
entry of wrong temperature into the computer. So surely, you know, entering some temperature data in the computer shouldn't result in an accident, or should it? You know, so that sort of sparks the interest there in terms of the system designs, software complexity. You know, there's no real human error associated with this, you might say. <clears throat> then this is another accident. You might be familiar with this one. This is rated as being, um, where is it on the article? It's uh, widely believed to be the first fatal collision involving an autonomous vehicle. Now, essentially, in this accident, this vehicle was being uh, driven autonomously, and it had a safety driver. The safety driver was, uh, you know, watching Netflix or something on their phone while the vehicle was doing what it was doing. Um, and the vehicle itself, there was no strict technical failures. The vehicle knew that there was a pedestrian. They classified what they were, but the vehicle didn't take action. It actually did not stop the car. And because the safety driver, for want of a better description, was not looking out the windscreen, they didn't detect the threat in time and avoid the accident. This is another accident. This is the, Boeing's, the first Boeing 737 MAX accident. Um, you know, there's mention of airspeed problems, mentions of uh, repairs that have been done. Um, mentions of new features on the aircraft that have not been made, a, uh, made aware of the aircrew. And then also later on there's questions about the engineering and regulatory complications, uh, differences of opinion between the federal and company safety experts. You know, so there are issues all over the place. This wasn't just a simple technical accident due to bird strike or whatever it is. This is a very complex accident. So there are challenges with regards to the, you know, with, with this situation, and that is that there is an increased speed of technical innovation and the need to be first, especially in the case of the 737 I mentioned a moment ago. Systems are becoming increasingly complex, not just technical systems, but also social systems, contracting systems. There was a mention earlier on about contracting uh, for services in and then expecting the responsibility to go to those organisations, whereas you still hold the responsibility. So there are complexity increases in organisations. There are increases uh, complexity and challenges with interdependency and interactions, connectivity, and then especially the human role changes from a doer to a supervisor. So the example there of the uh, self-driving car, you know, the driver was not the driver, they were the supervisor of the automation. So this is all about complexity. So how do we deal with complexity? Well, there is a traditional approach for dealing with complexity, and that is the divide and conquer approach. And some of you might be familiar with analytic reduction. You break the problem down into smaller parts, solve those smaller parts, put it back together and everything should be fine. And that uh, involves quite a few subtle but significant assumptions which are not always obvious, especially to those that are not involved in design engineering. So <clears throat> we might split the physical and functional aspects into distinct parts. We might split the behaviour into distinct events over time, so you might be familiar with chains of events. And then we analyse those parts separately and combine results. And as I mentioned, there is some significant assumptions with that. And one of those is that each part behaves independently, both individually and when combined as a whole with other parts. And then the parts themselves, their interactions and events, they're not dependent on feedback loops or non-linear interactions. And that's been mentioned a couple of times today. So there is a new approach, and this is the opportunity that I'm presenting. And this approach is based on systems theory or synthesis. So this is where you think about things as a whole, as a larger system, not breaking it down into parts, but linking, looking at the larger, bigger picture. So everything is presumed to be part of a system, however you so define that. It includes components and interactions, emergent properties, and feedback loops. So in terms of uh, an example of an emergent property, you might be familiar with the concept of wetness in the water in your glasses. So that's a system property. If you were to zoom into that, you know, with a microscope and look at the molecules of H2O, at that level of abstraction, the concept of wetness doesn't exist. So if you operate in a world at the microscopic level, you may never be aware of the emergent property of water that needs to be managed. And this approach basically allows you to zoom out and think differently and spot opportunities. So STAMP, a very brief overview. So where does it originate? Well, it originates from Professor Nancy Levison and her team at the MIT in the US. She wrote about it in her second book, Engineering a Safer World. 
And Nancy's quite kindly made that book available for free as a PDF download. So if you don't already have a copy, there's now no excuse. You can get a free PDF version of it. <clears throat> now, STAMP itself is an acronym, and it refers to two core things. It refers to what's called an accident causality model, which is systems theoretic accident model, and that's based on systems thinking, systems theory, and control theory concepts. There's a lot of theory there, but just bear with me. And then some processes built on, built on that accident causality model. Um, and these are a set of analysis and design processes. Now, you might be asking, well, what is an accident causality model? But I'm pretty sure a show of hands who's familiar with Swiss cheese, dominoes, chains and all of that good stuff. So that is an accident causality model and that essentially defines how you, uh, you know, think about how accidents could occur and that model, implicit as it might be, underpins efforts to think about, discuss, manage and engineer for safety but also it underpins the way you approach an investigation and what you look for and it's often not explicit or documented. So everyone has one embedded in their mind, a mental model, and this presentation is obviously intended to update your mental model. Now you'll notice um, I've used, in fact I'll say it just now, I've used square brackets um, throughout this presentation to highlight that I'm talking about specific concepts. So we're using the same English words, but I need to differentiate between the English words that you'll see in other safety analyses and papers from this because there are slightly different concepts that I need to highlight. <clears throat> now the traditional view of accident causality, the realm of Swiss cheese, dominoes and bow ties, is that accidents are caused by or due to a chain of directly related events or due to breach barriers. Hands up if that sounds like, sounds familiar. Okay, a few nods, few, uh, great, excellent, okay. And it essentially defines safety as a management of failures problem. So in principle, if you prevent, you prevent accidents by identifying and preventing failures or managing their consequences. Now, contrary, sort of built beyond that, further beyond that, using the systems theory, systems thinking approach and control theory, the stamp view introduces control loops and structures. So instead of thinking about Swiss cheese, dominoes and bow, dominoes and bow ties, we start to think about control loops and structures. So essentially, accidents are defined as involving complex dynamic processes, and it defines safety as a dynamic control problem. And to prevent accidents, you essentially enforce constraints on system behavior and interactions among system components using a control structure. Now, there's a lot of words there. A lot of them are quite technical, and I've put some square brackets in there. And this is just to highlight that the language used here, the, the, the vocabulary, is born of the control theory, and, sorry, control engineering and systems engineering. And so it's necessary to use that language to be precise about the things, the concepts that we're talking about. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So the traditional view for complex systems, it doesn't really deal with indirect or nonlinear interactions and complexity among system components and parts. Yes, bear with me, there's a lot of words there. It's, uh, you know, it's very specific engineering. It doesn't particularly deal with human behavior and human factors, software and complex hardware, system design errors, requirements errors, or no failure accidents, system behaved as designed, which the, uh, the autonomous vehicle accident is an example of. Um, and then also systemic factors that affect all components, barriers, layers of protection. <clears throat> so in the STAMP cause accident causality model, it's based upon systems theory and control theory, and it introduces concepts of systems, components and interactions, structure, hierarchy, control and feedback loops, emergent properties and constraints, and it's the same basis as the systems engineering discipline that's used to design complex systems, aircraft, weapons, and all of that good stuff. Um, and it covers the traditional view inadequacies really well, especially no failure system behaved as designed accidents and also where new technology and designs with no historical pedigree exist so things like autonomous vehicles and perhaps artificial intelligence now <clears throat> how do we actually prevent accidents then so we enforce constraints on system behavior and interactions and we do that with a control structure now a control structure is made up of these this basic concept of a control loop does this look familiar to everybody or should i go into that in any sort of detail. Okay, so essentially you have some form of con uh, control process which is under the control of a controller 
and it uh, controls and forces constraints on this process through some form of control actions. It receives feedback about that process which updates a process model and the control algorithm essentially defines how that controller behaves, provides control actions based on the feedback that it receives. Now, in terms of accident investigation or safety analysis, we're particularly interested in instances of what are called unsafe control actions, or in accident investigation, what you might call contributory control actions. So as part of the analysis, we look for these control loops, and then we look for instances of these unsafe control actions. Now, there are four general types of control actions. One is that a control action required for safety is not provided, so they don't do something. Uh, an unsafe control action is provided, so they do something that results in a negative outcome. A potential safe control action is provided too early or too late at the wrong time, so timing and sequence. And then the fourth is essentially to do with duration, too long or too short. <clears throat> and we can look at reasons why that unsafe control action, contributory control action can occur, and that could be due to issues with feedback, such as feedback delays or loss of feedback, no feedback. In terms of a, a process or mental model that is out of sequence or not updated, there was a mention there about the explosive potential of fuels earlier on. The mental model of those operators was clearly deficient because they didn't recognise the potential threat from explosions. And then in terms of control algorithms, so that would be about their behaviour. So they may have recognised the threat from the, you know, the fuel, but they didn't have the behaviours to actually do something about it. They didn't know what to do, perhaps. <clears throat> Once you've identified your unsafe control actions, you essentially walk around, work around this control loop to understand what all the contributors, causal scenarios are that led to those unsafe control actions, those contributory control actions. <clears throat> and then essentially those <clears throat> control loops are formed in some form of hierarchical control structure. So this is a model of your social technical system. This could be a physical process this could be an autonomous controller, this could be a human frontline operator, and this could be their management. And this is just a, a, a basic control structure model. Now, you, <clears throat> in terms of your control structure models, one of the things that really makes the stamp-based approaches stand out so powerful is as part of the analysis, you create your control structure model because they are model-based analysis approaches. And thinking in terms of control structures, it helps to organise your thinking and understanding about the accident you're investigating, but it also provides a natural path to follow a structure to work to. And if you're working as part of an investigation team, when your team come together to create this model, it helps form a common mental model amongst the team members so that they're all talking about the same thing and not their interpretation of it, if that makes sense. And for me, this is one of the real key things that make the stamp-based assessment so powerful. Now this is an example of a control structure model which is from the Tenerife disaster and it's very very straightforward but it contains a lot of valuable information. So along the bottom here we've got the physical process which was the trajectory interactions between two aircraft trajectories. So this aircraft and this aircraft were on the same runway at the same time. It was a very foggy day, so they couldn't visually see each other. The visual feedback loop was broken, and they were completely reliant on the radio equipment talking with the air traffic controller. And then, of course, um, if you're familiar with this accident, the mental model of the crew over here was that they had clearance to take off and that the runway was clear, so this aircraft was not in conflict, and they believed that they'd received clearance to take off, so they took off, and then these aircraft collided and lots of people died. Um, this, is an ad this is a more developed version of this control structure model. So all I've done is taken this part of the model and blown it up and included the air crew, the aircraft. So on this aircraft, there was a captain, a first officer, and a flight engineer. This was the late 70s. And they worked together to control the aircraft to ensure that it operated safely. Now you'll notice that this is technology, but these are humans. But they're treated the same in the control structure model. So this approach includes humans, hardware, software, all together in one approach. And this is an example from uh, the Hawaii ballistic missile alert that went out last year. This is just a whiteboard drawing. Was it last year? Maybe it was a year before. It was a, quite, it was a while ago now. But essentially, this individual who issued the alert, they, their mental model was, this is a real alert. I've got to do this. 
Um, because at the, on the morning of the incident, they'd switch, switched over between the two shifts and the outgoing shift decided they'd play a, play a drill on the incoming shift. And so somebody rang up on the official bat phone in the middle of the room and said, you know, this is an exercise and then proceeded to read the real attack message that said this is not a drill. So this individual is suddenly, oh, right, hang on. And that, that's the end of the story. So, and this is another control structure model. This is for an unmanned air system. This is for a watchkeeper system. There was an, there's been a couple of accidents for very similar reasons. I was able to model the air vehicle itself and the ground station with the mission commander and pilot, including their procedures, and then also the, uh, the manufacturers in there. And this was able to highlight issues with the laser, al laser altimeter and pseudo weight on wheels algorithm. So when you do control structure modeling, it's essentially like building a jigsaw puzzle. So when you go and do your investigation, you're looking for the jigsaw pieces. You're looking for those control loops and you're trying to arrange them in a hierarchy, control structure hierarchy, to try and understand what the system was at the time the accident occurred. But you might be familiar with this chap. He's a world famous statistician called George E.P. Box. And he said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I'm sure you must have heard that loads of times as well. <clears throat> so what are the stamp-based processes? So there are currently four stamp-based processes. There is the STPA hazard analysis approach, which is used during system design. You could use it during accident recommendations if you wanted to, but I won't touch on that today. Cast accident analysis, which we'll talk about today. STECA, which is systems theoretic early concept analysis. And then STPA SEC, which is systems theoretic process analysis security. This one is focused on cybersecurity. Now, fundamentally, all four of these processes are based upon the same principles, and they are very similar in reality. But in terms of cast accident analysis, that's what we're going to talk about today. So a very brief overview on this then. So... As part of an accident investigation process, a very generic accident investigation process, you will do some observa observation, you will document some information, some evidence, and then you'll form a plan as to how you want to execute your investigation, what type of resources you need, what type of team members you need, and all of that good stuff. Now, as part of that, you will generate some facts, you will do some analysis, you'll document some findings, you'll form some conclusions, and you'll make some recommendations. Now, it's really clear, I want to make it really clear that cast accident analysis fits in this sort of phase. So Donna, she had a really great picture, and she highlighted the analysis, the root cause analysis part. This is the same, so cast could fit in that slot. Now, you could use, when you get more practice with cast, you could actually use it to steer the plan of your investigation because you may have some initial reports that in, uh, indicate certain parts of the control structure were contributing to the accident. So you could use that information to steer your plan. And as I mentioned earlier, you could use STPA hazard analysis to help you design more effective recommendations. But we're going to focus on CAST. Now, if you imagine hypothetically all possible causes of accidents, they will be due to some form of unsafe or contributory control action from the control loop, and they will be due to a number of causal scenarios. Now, if an accident occurs, it won't be due to all of these unsafe contributory control actions. It will be due to some specific ones, and your investigation purpose is to go and find what they are, what the causal scenarios were. And that's what CAST focuses on, those specific contributory control actions and causal scenarios. Now, because of the systematic nature of cast accident analysis, you may also find other causes of the same accident that didn't occur on this occasion, or you might find other causes of other accidents which you now have the opportunity to potentially fix. <clears throat> okay, so the case study itself, mid-air collision, Uberlingen. A quick show of hands who are familiar with this particular accident. So a number of people, okay. Well, essentially what I did is I took the single source of information, the official investigation report, I reviewed that report, and then I applied the cast accidents analysis process to it to see what other learning we could get from the report. Um, so on the day, this occurred over uh, Uberlingen, Lake Constance in Germany in 2002. It was 21.35 local time, so it was dark, clear skies, 10 kilometres visibility, and it involved two aircraft, which was a Boeing 757, um, and a Tupolev Tu-154M. <clears throat> now, essentially, the two aircraft collided in flight, which resulted in total loss of the aircraft. 
71 people were killed, including a lot of children. And then there was damage to fields and forests, forests at the various impact sites. Now, in this particular accident, the story goes even worse because the actual air traffic controller involved in this accident was subject to a revenge killing of one of the Russian fathers of some children, and he was subject to a prison sentence. So this is just an overview of the trajectories of the two aircraft. So this is the 757, this is the Tupolev 2U-154. Um, this is the collision angle, uh, essentially they flew into each other. Um, so just quickly the timeline then. So at 21.33 and 3 seconds, 2 minutes, 29 minutes before the collision, there was a start of a conversation on the Tupolev aircraft about a TCAS indication. So the crew on that aircraft were aware that there was an intruding aircraft and they were talking about it and thinking about what they might do. A few seconds later or a minute or so later, the TCAS system alerted both crews on both flight decks that there was traffic. So from a mental model perspective, both air crew knew that there was some traffic that was potentially a threat. And then at uh, 43 seconds before the collision, the radar controller, the air traffic controller, instructed the crew of the Tupolev to essentially descend. So they did what the controller said and started to descend. They initiated a descent. And then as they started to initiate the descent, two seconds later, the TCAS system issued what's called a resolution advisory, which is essentially you need to pull up or descend very rapidly. So the aircraft, the 757, they received a descent command, whereas the Tupolev crew received a climb command, which was in contravention to what they'd already been told by the air traffic controller. So these guys on this side, they did what they're supposed to do. The guys on this side, well, they did what they thought they were supposed to do because they were working to their training, which in the Russian Republic at the time was do what the air traffic controller says, whereas they, the priority of TCAS was not highlighted. So they continued descending no matter what TCAS was saying, and they continue, continued descending this crew continued descending, so they both basically descended each other, into each other and collided. So that's, uh, that's, that's the sort of background to the case study. So in terms of cast accident analysis, ultimate goal, so when you do cast, what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify what was the control structure that existed to enforce what are called high-level safety constraints, and I'll talk about that in a second, and then establish how and why each level of that control structure essentially allowed or contributed to inadequate control at that level. And you'll notice I've not used the word failure anywhere in there, because as I said at the very beginning, this is not just about failures, this is about dangerous successes, you might want to call it. And then make recommendation, recommendations. So what changes to the control structure are necessary so that those high-level safety constraints can be enforced? And that's if they can, because there may be instances when you do an investigation where the system as presented cannot enforce those constraints. So in terms of the accident analysis process, CAS, this is basically on one page. So you document the losses, you identify the associated hazards, the high-level safety constraints associated with those hazards. You do some modeling, so the timeline you saw a minute ago, um, and then you control structure model, and then you do the analysis, and there's three parts to that. You analyze the physical process, then the control structure components, and then the, excuse me, structure of that control structure. Okay, so definition of a hazard. What is a hazard? So I've got my square brackets out, and it's now in purple, so it's really important to highlight this. So hands up who has used or heard of the haz word hazard before probably uses it on a daily basis, probably has lots of arguments and fights with people about it. Right, okay, great. All I'm saying here is when we're talking about the stamp-based approach, when we're talking about hazards, we're talking about this definition, which is specific, and it is more constrained, more narrow than the typical definition of a hazard everybody uses elsewhere. So when we talk about a hazard, usually it is anything that has the potential to cause an accident. Well, that's a very broad, very broad concept. So how do we sort of narrow that and bring it within the realm of our, our control, the designer's control? So we talk about a system state or set of conditions that together with a particular set of worst case environmental conditions will lead to an accident. So when people talk about a mountain range in terms of air traffic, people might say the mountain range is a hazard. Whereas under this definition, the mountain range is a mountain range. It's not a hazard. It only becomes a hazard in combination with some air traffic. 
and only then if they are on a conflict in trajectory. Does that make sense? Is that, yeah, excellent. So I just need to highlight, when somebody says, I'm going to compare stamp hazard analysis or stamp-based approach with other safety analysis methods, just keep it in the back of your mind that the definition is different. Okay, excellent, right. So in the context of this accident, there were two high-level hazards. One is the loss of safe separation margin between aircraft in controlled airspace. The second is to do with conflict in trajectories that lead to a loss of safe separation margin. And so a high-level safety constraint, this is basically a requirement that the whole control structure must enforce to avoid this hazard, which is that the hierarchical control structure shall prevent the loss of safe separation margin between aircraft. And then for the second one, the control structure shall prevent conflict in trajectories. So there's sort of two prime missions that that whole control structure, both pilots, aircraft, aircraft designers, air traffic controllers, aircraft, air traffic control service providers, all of them together, they have a contribution to these high level requirements. So then we get into hierarchical control structure modeling. So we start with talking about the physical uh, physical process, which in this case is the trajectory of two aircraft. Those trajectories are under the control of an aircraft, which is under the control of some crew on both sides, and then they've got some TCAS traffic collision and alerting systems that interact with each other and alert the crews. Then we've got the air traffic control themselves, and they communicate with the aircraft through radio control system. They have a sector radar picture, and they have some flight strips. Now you can expand that if you want to go to a lot of detail, you know, this is quite a high level abstraction, so this is sufficient to do some analysis and get some great results. But if you want to look at more systematic issues, you can start to look much higher. So this is the air traffic control system equipment <coughs> itself. This is the air traffic controller in their sector management suite with their supervisor. You've got the technical management of the air traffic control system, the technical stuff. Then you've got operations management, organization management, right up to the regulators and even to the ICAO if you want to go that far. Now obviously you'll notice there's no arrows or no uh, links between these and that's because there's not enough information in the original investigation report that looks at these. So that shows that perhaps the original investigators didn't go that far or that they just didn't re document it in the investigation <coughs> report. Now you'll notice this bit here, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment. Sorry, I'll just highlight that. So there's an air traffic controller, and then there's notionally a second air traffic controller, and that's important. So let's do the causal analysis then. So as I mentioned, there are three parts, physical analysis, controller, uh, component, and then structure analysis. So the first part is to talk about the physical equipment. So what was the physical equipment involved in this accident? Well, there were basically two aircraft with flying controls, traffic collision avoidance system, collision beacons, flashing lights, etc. And there was no failures with any of that. It all worked perfectly, no technical faults whatsoever. In terms of safety requirements, well, there were some warning requirements on the TCAS and that performed as it should do. So there's no failures there, no physical failures. But there were some unsafe interactions, and that was the trajectory of the flight path. Now, there were no significant physical equipment or process contextual factors involved in this. There were two perfectly serviceable aeroplanes with crews operating appropriately. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's no answer question there. How could two perfectly serviceable aircraft crash into each other? So we need to investigate that further and look at the control structure. So we do that in two parts. We do component analysis, structure analysis. As part of the component analysis, we essentially want to establish these things and any extra questions that we need to look at. So what are the safety-related roles and responsibilities of that component, so the pilots or the air traffic controller or the technical systems? What are the control and feedback ability, actuators and sensors, or any failures? So when I was talking about the control loop, you know, control actions are implemented by actuators and feedback is provided by sensors. Um, in terms of contributory control actions, well, we mentioned that the Russian crew descended when the air traffic controller told them to, and we know that the two descending at the same time resulted in the collision. Then we've got mental model and process model flaws. Then we've got contextual factors and then context within which decisions were made. So the air crew, they decided to descend because the air traffic controller told them to do it. The TCAS system then told them to do something opposite, but they didn't talk to the air traffic controller and say, hey, you know, the computer's telling us to do something else, what do I do? But in that situation, there may not be enough time to actually do anything. 
Um, and then look at the structure analysis, so structure of the control structure, architecture and interactions, communication and coordination, dynamics and changes or evolution, safety management system, safety information system and safety culture. So there's a lot of things you can look at. If you do this approach, you can look and find a lot of different things. <coughs> and you can also consider work as imagined and work as done. So let's quickly, we've already spoken a bit about the Bashkirian crew, so their mental model was that they know that there's a conflict in traffic, perhaps, but they know that the air traffic controller has told them to descend, so they're descending. They're doing what they should do, that's correct. But, the, but in the context of their actions, looking at the overall system, because the DHL crew are doing the same thing, that is what results in the accident. So I'm going to quickly move forward there. So this is a picture of the actual control suite. So there are two stations, two workstations, one for the sector with the 757 and the Tupolev on it, and then one with another aircraft that arrives later on. It's a disturbance. Now, essentially, on the day, there was only one air traffic controller, not two. So this would be what the control structure should look like. This air traffic controller looks after this airspace using this equipment, and this air traffic controller looks after this airspace with this equipment. But what was actually happening on the day was that this air traffic controller was essentially looking after all of it. And so that might be perfectly fine on a quiet evening when there's not much traffic, but if there's any disturbances or other problems, then this could quickly put you in a dangerous or accident situation. Does that make sense? Everybody got that? Excellent. So then we can talk about management. Well, what was the mental model of the air traffic controller? Well, um, in terms of this particular accident, on the night this accident occurred, the technical team, they were actually doing some technical changes to the technical equipment. And as part of that technical change, they actually removed some of the telecommunications equipment so that it wasn't working at the time. And so um, this air traffic controller here at a completely different center, they were sat looking at their radar screen and they got a conflict alert that said there's two aircraft coming together. But because they're outside that person's sector, they were not able to do anything about it. So they tried to call this air traffic controller by the phone, but the phone was not available so they could not prevent the accident. And at the time this accident occurred, these aircraft were coming together. This air traffic controller saw that there was an issue, but didn't realize how significant of an issue it was, and then was so happened disturbed by this other aircraft on a completely different radio frequency. So you can imagine somebody sat trying to work both of these workstations, moving around trying to listen to things and take action. And that's just incredibly difficult for one person. Okay, so summary, we've gone through that very, very quickly. That's just to give you a flavor. So from the official investigation report, there were two immediate causes. One was that there was an imminent separation infringement that was not noticed by the air traffic controller in time. So that was their mental model was not updated in time. The TU-154 crew followed the ATC instruction to descend and continued to do so after TCAS advised them to climb. There are three systemic causes highlighted in the report. One is to do with the integration of TCAS into the global aviation system. So in the Western world, it was better integrated. The pilots were trained, do what TCAS says, no matter what the air traffic controller says, do what TCAS says. Whereas in Russia, it was the other way around. They were taught to do what the air traffic controller said. <coughs> um, air navigation service provider, they did not ensure that all open ATC workstations were continuously staffed. And then the air navigation service provider tolerated for years single ATCO operations. So this was going on for years. So final thoughts, near misses. So on near misses, so an accident or near miss or incident reveals that the control structure was inadequate. And that's a fact. Some shape or form, it was inadequate. It didn't enforce safety constraints. So when people talk about root causes, I'm being facetious here, but technically there's only one root cause, and that is that the control structure was inadequate in some shape or form. So there's a massive learning opportunity from near misses and incidents, and they're cheap, and people are more willing to speak to you when you do your investigation and give information freely.